Hello and welcome back to the Rugby Pod. Big Jim and Goody are with me as usual and we're brought to you this week by Manscaped, the ultimate tool for your family jewels. If you haven't signed up yet, what on earth are you waiting for? They've just released the new Lawn Mower 3.0 trimmer and it's a technological masterpiece. So join the 2 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped for the below the waist grooming and you can get 20% off plus free shipping with the code RugbyPod at manscaped.com. You'll be a modern man and you'll be supporting the rugby pod as well. How's your week been? How's your week been, lads? Great. Unbelievable. How's it, Jim? You're positive well, Friday, this week. Well, Friday cheered me up, obviously. Uh, it feels like a long time ago. Having I mean, Ruggers on a Friday night just doesn't feel the same as the weekend, even though that I like Ruggers on a Friday night. It seems like a while ago, but I'm in a good place, I'd say. The kids are back at school. I've been training. I need some advice, actually, Andrew. I don't know whether you will be the one that could be able to help me on there, but you might well be because you're an influencer, so you'll probably get stuff going into your DMs left, right and centre. So as we know, Andy, Andy Rowe and myself are doing the Eaton Mess sprint triathlon in yeah. May, and yeah. I've got to take it seriously this time. And Andy Rowe's been pissing himself at me because he's thinking back to the one two years ago where I've got some hot pants on from Decathlon that cost me th- literally cost me three pounds. <laughs> I've got a t-shirt on that I wore when I was 128 kgs in my private Saracen. So literally, <laughs> it literally looked like it was 10 sizes too big. So as we know, I've invested in a bike. Um, so I've got a specialized gravel bike, which is great, not custom made. I'd say it's just big enough for me to ride. And I've been pounding the roads. Uh, I say pounding the roads. I've done two 5k runs, but effectively pounding them. <laughs> Yeah. So I've got a bit of the gear and a bit of the idea, but who is making, and if anyone's out there, and good if you can't answer this, who is making a 3XL long with padding in the pouch, so it looks like I'm absolutely massive, um, a tri suit that I can go in the water, I can then get out of the water, probably first or second, onto the bike, off the bike, onto the road, and I look a million dollars, and I look like... Malachi Fekatoa, basically all in one, <laughs> all in one package. Well, with, Andrew, the quad, with the quads on his middle quad as well. Exactly. I just want to look massive and not like an absolute circus act, which I mean, I imagine there'll be a part of that. So it's only around the corner and I've got the bit between my teeth. My air's growing back. We're slowly coming out of lockdown. I look amazing. And we've got this on the horizon, the eat and mess, and I want to smash it. So Goody. We'll put it out there. If anything comes into your DMs about where I can get a triple XL long with a pouch, yeah, is suit. It a tri- I don't know what a tri suit is. If it was bib shorts for cycling, I could I could point you in the right direction. But they're the things that just come over your nipple. So it's a bit of a borat suit, but then it is obviously got padding and on your horse and protecting your gooch as well. So um, yeah, tri suit. A tri suit. I've got no idea, mate. I don't do triathlons. I can't run. Do you both have to shop at special places because you're bigger? What, what are you on about, Andy, bro? I am. Um, I've lost eight and a half kilos down to tweak meals, to be honest. Um, before, I'm, Andrew, I'm you would have... You, before, Andrew, I've seen your feet that used to kind of... You, you wear them loafers and they kind of... I've never seen feet... <laughs> I've never seen feet that flap over the top of shoes. You know, like as in they're spilling out the sides. But, well, I mean, what do you mean? I got voted back in the day at Leicester Tigers. They did the ideal rugby player in terms of body parts. Um, and it was like the best looking guy. I can't remember who it was. The best arms, the best. Uh, Jim, you weren't anywhere to be seen. I got the best feet. I had the, I had the nicest feet at the time. Uh, voted for by the physios and uh, the rehab lady, Julie Hayton. Um, I had the best feet, mate. So abuse anything about me apart from my hair and my feet. That's all I care. The rest of it, fill your boots on because it's horrible, but my feet are all right. Top to bottom, I have to genu- genuinely. I, I'm if I wasn't a real life giant, I would be so trendy, it would be on beyond belief. Yeah, I really would. <laughs> I see clothes in the window and I think that's me. I walk past All Saints or a top shop or wherever it could top be. Top a girl shop, but there we go. So you get you're, okay. a cross dresser. you're a cross dresser, yeah, that's fine, which is which is fine. And I, I, I would do because it's you wear, wear whatever, I pull it off, but yeah, I'm very limited to what I can get, Andy Rowe. It's uh. Very limited to a lot of things in life, to be honest. I don't fit in most cars. I don't travel well. Um, <laughs> I need a specially made bed. I, I barely fit in the bath. Well, I have a bath, but the only thing that's getting washed is my arse. <laughs> so my knees don't get touched. Even if I move around, I cannot wash my knees in the bath. 
have you ever tried to put your feet? Because I've got a bath that goes against the wall. So my feet are on the wall. I can't bow my knees back. So I've just got to get the sponge that has been everywhere just to wash my knees. Life is not made for, uh, giants. I mean, giants like me. Then it's just not. Yeah. Do you ever, when you're in the bath, do you ever flip over and go sort of tummy first so you can wash your knees that way? Tell my back that. Do you think my back goes that way <laughs> or not? I would do. Oh, dear, oh, dear. I yeah, no, you, you, you are looking good Jim and, and you know I know every week you come on here and say how great you look and you know it, you're, you're a stylish man and all that sort of thing but I had a little word myself this week as well I don't know if you noticed I let the missus loose on my hair and you know lockdown is what it is we've seen a lot of relationships end during lockdown down to blokes needing haircuts and Jim you said it yourself Bex Barbers you weren't happy were you you weren't happy Bex Bush Barbers, that's what we call it. Yeah. <laughs> I am my, not happy. My missus has done a hell of a job because she said, now I went to see the surgeon last week and uh, he said, look, you can get out and about a bit more now. You can put a bit of weight on your crutches through your Das Booten. I've taught the twins Das Boot, um, as I put it on. Um, and I'm allowed to go out and walk around a bit but on crutches and put 20% of my body weight through it. So it's about 10 kilos, to be honest. Um <laughs> It's not actually, it's about 10,000. <laughs> yeah. Um, and my missus said, if, if you're coming out with us and the, and the twins, you need to sort the lid out because it's, it's grown so long. And she's been pecking my head for ages. Let me, let me at it. Let me have a, a, a bit of a clip of it. So she's got the clippers out, got the, bought some professional scissors and she had a right good go at it, to be fair. I said, now what are you going to do about the rest of the body? She said, lights off. Let me just feel your hair because it looks good, but the lights are still staying off in the bedroom. So um, that was as exciting as my weekend got. But yeah. I feel a bit better, a bit lighter again because my hair's gone. How good was the weekend for Scotland, Jim? Well, I don't know if you saw it on social media. I, I spoke to Hamish today. I said, anyone would think you won on Friday with the activity on social media. Fully deserved. All I know is fourth, third, second or first, we finished above England in the Guinness <laughs> Six Nations and... We beat France in Paris. You didn't and... think they had a show, though, did you? You told me to cash out. I lost 400 quid on your advice. Well, um, I'll be honest. I did sit there on Friday night, and I might have had a gin and tonic too many as I was watching the game. It was, a, it was like I'm in my element there, because normally when we're watching rugby is generally on a Saturday or Sunday. The kids are knocking about. They don't understand that dad's working by watching the rugby. Friday night, 8 o'clock, the fire's on, the dog's asleep, Beck's asleep and I'm sat there with a cold gin and tonic watching the Ruggers. So one leads to six or seven responsibly. And next thing, I could barely see the game. I'm watching it. <laughs> I'm like, it's just a repeat. We're doing all right. And then come the last play of the game. It's just, it's just such a Scottish thing to do now, just to win these big moments and win, win matches. But um, I don't think anyone, if you look at history, which we have to look at because we obviously can't see into the future unless you're me, if you look at history and you look back, we didn't not, not stand the chance, but you thought France with the way that they were playing and the fact that Scotland are good, but how good are we? We were obviously great against England and we've not been great since then, but we've been all right, that we didn't stand the chance. And there's a few things around it. You need a bit of luck. You need a bounce of the ball. It, it looked like it was going to be one of them games where you were like, oh, could have beat France, but we didn't. And that's that. That's Scotland. But Bruce Delan, I don't know what you're thinking, mate. Bruce. Bruce, Bruce mate, yeah. Bruce. His name's Bryce, but we'll call him Bruce anyway because he had an absolute... It wasn't a Brucey bonus. It was a Brucey bonus for Scotland, actually, wasn't it? That, well, that, well, that arguably, let's just say that that's why I'm calling him Bruce. So, Brucey Doolan, what are you thinking, mate? I, I, for the first time, I ain't screaming kickers to the balls. <laughs> and... To be fair, you know, we had to win the line out off the back of it and we had to show a little bit of patience, a bit of resilience. We now look very good close to the try line. Now, anyone who's watched Scotland before would have seen that we've got ourselves in really good opportunities, but when we need to score or when we play against the big power teams, your England, Ireland, everyone in the Six Nations apart from Italy, we struggled to convert. But when it mattered most, and we've got a player like Duan van der Merwe who can kind of score out of nothing and score in a bit of traffic, we're just good now. Yeah. We're good, and it's made the Six Nations very, very interesting. But from a selfish point of view, and a patriotic point of view, and a bandwagon point of view, and a Lions point of view, I'm happy, obviously. Uh, and it did set up the weekend nicely. I was, yeah, it was obviously took the wind out of the sails of, 
of Wales winning it, obviously on the day or whatever, because the game was, was postponed. But I think the Six Nations as a whole was as good, arguably, as it could have been. I actually thought it was a great tournament, but buzzing for the lads all over social. Hamish has got another thousand followers on Instagram. He's up to about 11, 12,000, the poor bloke, <laughs> one of the best players in the world. Not that that's a thing. But uh, yeah, very, very, very happy. Andrew, did you eat your slippers? Could, did you see that coming? Uh, I did not see France capitulating a little bit in the way they did. And a lot of it was down to Scotland's pressure. But it was just, maybe it was France going back to their old way. So they knew they needed to win by 21 points. And it was the kind of, because Scotland were so resilient and put a load of pressure on them, then they just started doing a few odd things. There's a couple of decisions that didn't go their way. You, and you talk about big moments. For France, they had the a line out five minutes out just before half time, which would have had they have taken that line out, driven over and scored, that would have given them I can't remember the exact score line, but it'd have been something like a twelve point lead at the time. Then you start thinking about the twenty one point victory to try and win the Six Nations, but their frustrations got on top of them. They started making errors, a couple of um, decisions didn't go their way. Scotland were brilliant. Um, you know, the weather terms, suited us as well. Yeah, the weather the weather did suit them. So, you know, as soon as it was tipping down the rain, you knew that Wales were going to be champions. But the French, and you only have to sum it up with Bruce Doulan at the end. That's just so French, right? The game is won. You can't do any more. So you can't go and win the, the Six Nations right now by, with a, you know, 30 seconds left on the clock trying to run it from your own try line. What are you doing, son? Just boot it out. Just see you later. Take the win. But fair play to Scotland. Do Van der Merber, as Jim said. Um, I mean, what a unit. I would love to see him in all his glory because he is a man that has just probably has got everything, hasn't he? The full package, he, I'd say. <laughs> he looks like he has. He looks <laughs> like he has. And look, some people are complaining about Duan Van der Merber playing because of his South African blood, heritage. He's South uh, African, uh, effectively. Uh, mate, Hamish Watson's English, but don't worry about it. Yeah, but with a name like Hamish Watson, mate, you're more Scottish than <laughs> Hamish Watson. Yeah. Um, so, in that sense, but we need, look, he's a player that we need in terms of a point of difference. Yeah, very um, good. Yeah, he can, he can do something out of nothing. What do you make of Finn Russell's red card? Um, I mean, listen, I understand, and we talk about this regularly, weekly, uh, about where the game of rugby's going. And, you know, there's been debates about having your arm close to your body, having your arm outstretched. For me, Finn Russell has got his hand open. He's trying to fend him off with a, a handoff to the shoulder. And then, obviously, the contact is the forearm. You see, you know, if you still it, you see where the contact's made. Uh, and I think it's on his shoulder. I was very surprised with the process that Wayne, Wayne Barnes, best referee in the world, but he can only go off the pictures that they were showing. And again, in France, you don't get all the pictures I believe there's a picture from the other side and I've seen it and I've seen a replay of it now from the actual way that Finn Russell's attacking. So from, you know, face on where his hands out open trying to fend someone and it's an accidental rugby incident where he's landed, you know, and, and the contact's risen up to, to Bruce Doolan's neck. So I'm glad it didn't change the course of the game. I'm glad Scotland won. Um, but so good. Me, I'm glad Scotland won. Well, of course I want Scotland to win, mate. I don't like France. Oh, okay. So fine. Sorry, I just <laughs> I've, I've never heard you say that before. But thank you. Yeah. Um, well, I, did you not see on Twitter? I put out "Come on, Scotland" with some Scotland. There were so there were so many tweets coming from your Twitter engine. I I just only picked up about three or four out of the hundred that you put out. <laughs> well, that's the kids go to bed. You just start tweeting, don't you? Um, so yeah, I, it, for me, it's not a red card. The ironic thing, and I think when it when he lands on Dulan, and it, it looks a lot worse than it is, but the process. Point of contact, first point of contact, I thought was his elbow on just around the shoulder. Uh, but it does ride up to his neck. Um, and the ironic thing is Bruce Doolan and Finn Russell are, um, are teammates. And, you know, there's a massive game for Racing this week in the Champions Cup that Finn may or may not miss now. Um, and I don't think it's a red card, but Jim, your thoughts? No, I don't. There's no point even talking about it now because... It, there's obviously one a week at least, two or three a week that we, we could speak about, but I was just like, yeah, it's not a red card, IMO. It's There's not a huge amount of force. You know, it's not a head on head. It's not a shoulder on head. It's just, it's, it's a rugby incident without sounding like a fruity dude, like it. But it, maybe it's my fault. I text Barnsley in the week and my last message to him was, Barnsley, whatever you do, have a good game, but do not send any Scots off. And then 
he obviously sent our best player off, arguably. So it didn't have much effect. Obviously, France had a yellow card as well in the last few minutes of the game. And we won, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's history. I don't mind. I don't care. Jim, how do you assess Scotland's Six Nations? Uh, above England. Above well, they England. finished fourth. Yeah, fourth. I mean, it's the best Six Nations they've ever had, but they still finished fourth. Well, no, we uh, finished third when Dean Ryan was coaching <laughs> and I was playing as well. Statistically, I, I read it was your best ever Six Nations as a country. Uh, well, because the most points. I well, don't even know how that works. Either way, you're celebrating like you won it, but you finished fourth. But you did finish above England. I think you go based on the performances, Andy wrote. I think we've been brilliant. I'll be honest with you. 52 points oh, against Italy. Massive win against England. 38 years of hurt. We've not beat France since, what, 1999, was it, or something as well? And Paris. So we beat them. The only bad game was the Ireland game, really. Could have, should have beat Wales. Red card in that game. So... In the Lions year, when Gregor was under pressure, I'm happy. I am happy. What I'm even happier about, we need to give a shout out to the guy who did Stuart Hogg's lid. He wow. must be on cloud. Not, he must be sat back at home, looking on the internet, on eBay, wherever you buy Yacht Bay from or whatever, thinking, <laughs> come to I've me, baby. It. I've that's, made it. That's nearly as big as a Spotify deal. But to be fair, here's a stat for you, Jim. <clears throat> Sorry. Here, to be fair, here's a stat for you, Jim. Scotland missed out on the Grand Slam by six points. All right. That's how close you were to a Grand Slam. Yeah, six points. Yeah. In the two defeats that cost you a Grand Slam to Wales and to Ireland, the margin was six points. Six oh, points away. Uh, how far were England? How far were England? About, about 300, I think. But yeah. Well, as you know, we'll be moving over to Spotify in the next couple of months. And just to confirm, the pod will always be free on Spotify and they're going to be supporting us to grow and do more. It's pretty exciting for us. So head over there and get involved. And with our move over to Spotify, we'll be stopping Patreon. So firstly, a massive, massive thank you to everyone who supported us on there over the last few seasons. And if you want to get your fix on more quality rugby content and listen to some of our best Patreon episodes from the past few seasons, you can still do so by heading over to the 15.rugby. It's a new site with some of the best rugby writers and content in the world, similar to what Athletic have done for football. They have the likes of Owen Jones, David Flatman, Jamie Lyle, Nigel Owens, Nolly Waterman, Graham Simmons, Chris Ashton, Jake White, and lots more people contributing. They also do a podcast series with the rugby centurions like O'Driscoll, McCaw, and Jean de Villiers. And you can join now for a limited period and get a massive 40% off using the code RugbyPod. That works out to be less than one pound per month for hundreds of quality articles, interviews, and shows. So head to the15.rugby. That, that's the followed by the letters xv.rugby and use the code RugbyPod for 40% off. Talking about the Spotify deal, as we have to, and that's the one thing that people have said, isn't it? People have said, oh, you can't listen to it now because you need a subscription. To be clear, everyone, you don't need a subscription. Spotify will sit the podcasts on there for free. You just need to download Spotify. And I don't think whether we've made that clear enough to the millions of listeners. The only downside that people have found is people think you have to have a subscription to it. You don't. You can get a premium subscription, which takes away all the adverts, but you can still listen to it for free. So uh, come join us on Spotify. Well, Scotland's win in Paris handed the Six Nations title to Wales. And we can have a chat with Six Nations title winner and one of the stars of the tournament, Lewis Rees Samet, joins us. How are you, mate? Yeah, really good, mate. Lewis, thanks for coming on, buddy. Let's clear it up then. We were just talking off air about it, but we may as well clear it up with the millions of people who will soon be chanting your name in stadiums when it comes back round. Some people are calling you Louis, right? Which I yeah. think is a cool name. There was a guy in One Direction called Louis who was quite cool. But what is it? It says Lewis on the screen. That's what it's saying to me. Is, is that right? Uh, it's Lewis. Like, it's obviously, if you look at it, it's Louis, but um, everyone's always ever called me Lewis. So um, I'll put my foot down now and tell everyone it's Lewis. There we go. Absolutely. There we go. 100%. Heard it here first. Love it. Love it. And so your parents call you Lewis, do they? Because that's all that matters. Whatever yeah. your mum calls you, when yeah, you're my, in trouble, that's your real name. Yeah, my mum wanted to call me Louis, but. I don't know, I must have liked the, the name when I was younger, so she's always called me Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Well, it's great having you on. I can see you sat there in your Gloucester stash. I thought you'd still be wearing the Wales top with the Wales shirt on. You've got the medal around your neck from the Six Nations as well. Um, <laughs> mate, how surreal. How surreal. The um, 
from those days of playing for Gloucester, when I'm commentating on you saying he's definitely English, get him in the England squad, and then you absolutely, <laughs> absolutely buried me on social media just with a Welsh flag. Um, what yeah. a rise. It's great to have you on. And, um, mate, what an unbelievable few months. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's very surreal. And um, I'm loving it. I'm loving playing rugby for, for Gloucester and for Wales. How is it though, Lewis, this whole situation you find yourselves in? I was trying to work out whether or not I'm old enough to be your dad. I've still not managed to work it out. I still think there's element in there, which for me is absolutely mental. Like you're such a young lad and not only you're playing, there's no fans at the stadium and all these things that we can maybe yeah. touch on. You're building this social media presence. We spoke about it on the phone just before you came on about that. I mean, is it all a bit of a whirlwind? Are you taking it in your stride or is it a little bit weird, everything that's happening in your life right now? It was it was a bit weird at the start, um, and then after a few games, I kind of <laughs> kind of got used to it. And yeah, this obviously the the social media kind of shot up after I think it was the Scotland <laughs> after the Scotland game. Which I one? Had, the Instagram? Your Instagram game rose. Yeah, I, I got like seventy thousand people following me after just that one try or the two tries. I don't know. It was, it was very weird. Forget the tries, mate. You've made it. You get 70,000 followers extra on Instagram. <laughs> that is when you know you've made it. Goody, I don't know what we're going to do. Yeah, no, that's unbelievable. Um, well, let's talk about the weekend then. Obviously, uh, the celebrations on Sunday uh, down at the Vale of Morgan, the hotel, the training ground yeah. uh, and everything you have there. Talk us through that. Was it a bit weird? Were you allowed to have a few beers together or was it very uh, COVID secure? And we, had a, we, had a few, we had a few Prosecco's, actually. Oh, nice. Yeah. You kept it classy in Wales, eh? Yeah. Very in Welsh. I think that was the uh, the first time I've actually had prosecco. To be honest, um, but yeah, it was it was weird because like obviously you're just in a barn and it's like yay, it's not, <laughs> not full of fans and screaming. But yeah, it's obviously to win the Six Nations is obviously a dream come true, and um, yeah, really enjoyed it. Yeah, I bet you did. Unbelievable scenes. Do you think it was easier for you and uh, the transition from being a club player coming through? And they're not being fans. So you could just go out there and kind of yeah. a little bit less pressure. Did it feel that way? Yeah. It, yeah. Well, I, obviously, I don't know what it would feel like with fans, but there was definitely a lot less pressure when, when I was running into the stadiums, um, especially watching it from TV when there was fans and going to like Stade de France and there's 80,000 French fans screaming at you. You don't want to make one mistake, do you? So, uh, mm. yeah, it's def it was definitely a lot easier. Um, but yeah, I just can't wait to, for fans to be back, to be honest. Yeah, and you've taken it like a Dr. Water as well. Obviously, playing for Gloucester as well, that's gone really smoothly. Um, just wondering if you took your medal into the training ground to show Johnny May this week, or, or how's that gone? <laughs> He's been getting some stick by, uh, by Mark Atkinson, which is quite funny. Um, but no, I didn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> so humble. So humble. How has it been back at Gloucester? You're, you're obviously... Back to normality yeah. uh, on Friday. Good win against Exeter. Johnny was obviously in the team. He, tried to, he should have just dived. He should have just done what he did against Italy. <laughs> but, um, thought thought yeah. it was legit. But was it probably better for you to get back and get back playing for Gloucester and let the kind of Scotland France game unfold? Yeah. Well, obviously our game was brought forward, so we finished our we finished against Exeter. Had a good win, and then my dad drove me up. Um, so on the way back, I could watch the game. Um, so I caught the last 10 minutes in the house with my, my family were here. Um, and yeah, I was, I was so scared. I didn't, I, I didn't know if France were going to win it or, or what happened. Even in the 82nd minute, I was, I was still nervous when, when France couldn't even win. Um, but yeah, it was, it, that was a good night to say the least. Yeah, I can imagine it was. Um, let's let's talk about that then, because you know people look at you, you've exploded on social media, you've won the Six Nations, um, you know, you're probably one of the first wingers on people's list now to, to be part of the Lions tour in the summer, and I don't want to maybe put that on you, but your lifestyle, you you know, you're still very young. You're, yeah. living, at, you're living at home still, aren't you? There's a, there's a big family network that you rely on. Um, yeah. it's, not, it's not quite the glamour of the big house, the flash car and all that stuff yet, but, um, um, you know, you're very humble lad. Where, where are you living? Because you travel a bit to Gloucester as well to get there, don't you? Yeah, well, I actually, uh, I moved into a flat with my brother about a year ago. But it's like five minutes from mum and dad's. Um, but I'm actually at mum and dad's now. <laughs> I'm uh, I'm here every night for dinner. Um. <laughs> <laughs> How are they dealing with it, uh, Lewis? So I mean, it must be weird. I don't know. Are they are they into rugby? Are you <laughs> yeah. into rugby being Welsh, of course. Yeah, they are. They are 
um, well, they're telling me I'm making them very proud, so <laughs> I must be doing something right. Are they, are they looking at you differently? Is your dad like, before, like I do with my kids, I just tell them off and just let them get on. But if, you know, one of them <laughs> makes it to become a Scotland international, I might look at them slightly differently. But do, <laughs> do, you, do, you, do you feel that? Do you, do you feel uh, that relationship? Like, I mean, what's your dad saying? Is he just... He's still, he's still having a go at me if I do something bad. So I don't think, yeah, I don't think anything's changed too much. <laughs> Uh, good stuff, good stuff. Um, let's talk about the lads in the Wales camp then, because obviously there's a massive amount of experience, and especially in the Six Nations with a lot of the guys coming back into form and fitness. You know, what was it like for you as a youngster going in through your, obviously all the age groups, but going into that Welsh camp you know, with the likes of Alan Wynne Jones, who Jim's written off many times, George North, <laughs> Jonathan Davis, Dan Bigger, you know, guys that we've spoken to on the podcast here. They're yeah. proper good lads, but also the experience. Is it a little bit daunting when you first go in, or are they just taking when, so yeah, when I Jesus quick, we're having him. <laughs> when I first went in last Six Nations obviously I didn't play but um, they made me feel very welcome and I settled in really well um, obviously at the start I was I walked into change rooms and like you see all these big players and you you just say like hi from a distance and then um, the next campaign you kind of settled in then and, and you're making friendships and you're getting closer with the boys and then that just obviously helps massively when, when you're playing as well um, because if you don't really know someone, you're not, you know, the chemistry's not going to be there and stuff like that, is it? So, um, yeah, I've definitely settled in well and all the boys have made me feel very welcome. And what about all this stuff now? So I, I spoke about it at, at the start, but as a young lad playing international rugby now, blown up on Instagram and TikTok and uh, this snap, snap, snap or whatever this is called, <laughs> <laughs> is there any advice around this? Because obviously you're sought after now to speak to but you're a young lad who, I don't know if you've been media trained, I don't know what they do with lads now. You're a working class club like Gloucester. I'm sure they've been inundated with phone calls to be able to get to chat to you. There's talk of the Lions stuff. And like I said, it's probably a little bit overwhelming, but I think it'd be quite interesting for people to hear when they walk past you in the street, whether, you know, you has anyone said, oh, you should do this, you should, you should like, don't speak to these, don't speak to them, <laughs> stay off social. I mean, is there, is there advice out there for young athletes coming through? Because I suppose, Lewis, it's <laughs> twofold, isn't it? We, something we spoke about. You look at some of the most famous athletes in the world, Yeah. arguably it's because what they're doing on the pitch or track and field or whatever they're doing, but also what they do around social media and building a brand. Is there any advice out there for you? Is anyone looking after you? Uh, yeah, so obviously you've got your agent and stuff like that. And then but I, I didn't actually get much media training because I'd like everything's happened so in such a short period of time and like obviously loads of people asking to to interview you or something like that. So it's I've just been using like every interview as like a training <laughs> training method or or something like that. Um but yeah there's definitely advice out there. Um a few of the Gloucester like media team have, have been speaking to me. Um but they choose who I like do podcasts with, who I do all this stuff with. So I'm not just constantly doing it. And I don't really, I don't try and focus on, I just try and focus on my game. And um, well, I've only just got back from training kind of thing. So um, I do have busy days. I'm not uh, just sat at home doing nothing. Um, but yeah, it's, I'm, I'm thoroughly enjoying this like professional rugby. And um, yeah, I'm just trying to keep on doing what I'm doing. Um, and and let them kind of deal with who I speak to, kind of thing. Yeah, very wise. Yeah. Very wise. Um, but also uh, a source of knowledge that you could tap into. Um, Rumour has it that you were dating Paul Scholes' daughter at one point. Um, I hear I hear you're single now, but did Scholes ever try and get his play for England? That's all I need to know because he is English <laughs> till the cows come home. Yeah, he, he had a word with me, but it wasn't. It was, it was going. It, it was going in one year out the other. So. Uh, yeah, and how's he how's he getting on with rugby? Is he did he enjoy a bit of rugby watching you obviously coming he, through? Yeah, he'd actually never watched rugby, he'd never watched a rugby game. Um and then he watched me for the first time. I think it was Axeter. We played Axeter at home last year, and that was the very first rugby game he'd ever been to. Um so yeah, he, he said he enjoyed it and he, he still watches the games actually. Lewis, just before you go then, uh, some quick players out there. There was all the talk before you played against England. Who was quicker out of yourself and Johnny May? I think we saw that um, as well. But, I mean, is that true? How much quicker are you than Johnny? <laughs> He's going to hate this. Just <laughs> h- humbly, how much quicker? I think, no, Johnny would actually done shuttles across the pitch then. So he was a bit tired. I'll give it to him. So uh, I was a bit more fresh in, in that race. Um, but, yeah, 
on another day he could beat me I'm not sure he's he, at the end of the day he's my teammate <laughs> I'm never going to say who's faster because we don't know yeah we do know oh, we know it's you we know it's you uh, does he <laughs> just a quick question on Johnny May then does he still make the chicken noises around the training <laughs> ground is that is that still going on or, or is, has that been beaten I think, out I think that story's died now I I don't hear that get it going again get it going again definitely and last <laughs> thing I will ask you then um, it's a, obviously a massive year we can't get you on the podcast and not ask you about potentially playing for the Lions. Your name has been sort of banded around as one of the form players in the Six Nations, which, you know, rightly so, then links you with the Lions spot. How much would that mean to you and, and you know, the phenomenal opportunity that that would bring? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, that's that's ultimately every rugby player's dream and that's to play for the Lions. And, um, well, yeah, no, I, I'm not looking at that. Yeah, because we've still got we still got nine or ten more games we've lost before the team even gets picked. So um I could play rubbish in all of them and not get picked. So the Six Nation wasn't the be all and end all kind of thing. Um so I'm just focusing on Gloucester now. We've got a big game Friday in the Champions Cup. Um and then we got the rest of the season to finish and then we'll see what the situation is. All right, Lewis, thank you very much for coming on the show, mate. Best of luck for the rest of the season with Gloucester, and hopefully we see you in that Lions jersey before the end of the year as well. <laughs> good bloke. Good lad. Nice yeah, lad. Real nice good lad. lad. Yeah. Very tough for him. Very tough for him because I spoke to him before, and you could say he was a bit unsure, and, you know, um, it's all new to him, isn't it? You know, you've yeah. got to think these lads. And this is the big thing, right? And we've spoken about it before, Goody, whether or not we've broken the mould in – how people will consume media <laughs> humbly arguably we have we've just started with spotify so <laughs> but it's a tough one is it because these professionals now and we've seen it in football and i don't want to speak out of turn here where it almost seems like they're inaccessible sometimes they're almost like too big and too great and too famous for us to engage with but the love of rugby and what a lot of people say is you feel intertwined with the players and there's a lot of parallels and you, and you're normal. What I'm trying to say is you're normal. But now what we're seeing with these young lads coming through, Goody, is, you know, Lewis Rees Summit's got 250,000 followers on Instagram. If you don't think that's mm. a thing, listeners, I'm telling you now it's a thing. Um, <laughs> that is a thing. But, but that's how they're living their lives now. They, you know, they're doing what they're doing. They're carving up and they're getting all the plaudits or whatever. And then you've got to come and speak to some old fogies like us. I can't believe I genuinely could be his dad, I reckon. Um <laughs> Well, how do you? I, mean, I don't look. Like, I don't look. I don't look. I don't look like. I, that can be sad. I'm 38, but I'm 37, so might be where you got a speed from. So you could be. You could be his dad, mate. You could be his dad. A, then. a young dad, exactly. So it's great that he's come on. It's it's all very new to him. Uh, big shout out to Gloucester for allowing him to come on. Um, I knew Wales would win the championship, and it's uh, <laughs> yeah. you know we'll you be in this like corner it. pushing him for the Lions. Yeah, nice ball. It, it, that's the thing. It is tough. You, it, it, so much has come to him so quickly through his own ability and just trying to handle it and, you know, bat some things off, but engage fully in others. Um, what a lovely, lovely down-to-earth guy. And just the thing when he says, you know, I went into the change room and I just said hello from afar to some of the big names. Um, it's just so humbling to hear that, isn't it? Where people do still genuinely get the, the buzz around seeing big names that they're playing with themselves. So, um, yeah, quality young guy, uh, unbelievably quick. He's definitely faster than Johnny May. Um, and hopefully, well, form dictates, he should be in the, definitely in the mix for the Lions touring this summer. I'd love to see him. What a story that would be. That's the Six Nations done and dusted. And Jim, you told us last week before it was announced that the Lions tour was going ahead in South Africa. You already told us and everyone else is picking the Lions 15. So we thought we'd better get yours, hadn't we? Okay. Ready? Yeah. Are you going to nod or just say yes, or just do I just well, give I've you done, every player? I've done mine as well, mate. So you know we could debate. We could. Do, I mean, first of all, how about you both rattle rattle through them and then afterwards work out the differences? Okay, okay. so we'll go one to fifteen, then, Jim. All right, you go. I'll go first, and you go first on the next one. Okay, so I've gone for Win Jones of Win Wales. Jones. People, Win Jones. People, have you gone for Win Jones? Yeah, I've got three names. I tweeted. Down. I tweeted that that after week two, and people are sending me laughing emojis. I don't know whether yeah. it was laughing or crying. Yeah. Well, I had three loose heads. Wynne Jones, Rory Sutherland, and Kean Healy. But I've gone with Wynne okay. Jones. Okay, we're going to start at 15. I'm I'm just hitting you with... I don't want to name check anyone else, because I just okay. want to hit you with All right, what Wynne I know. Jones it is. Uh, Hooker, I'll go first. Ken Owens. Go. Oh, okay. Jamie George. 
Nah, not on form. You're picking him because he's your mate. No, mine's a bit of everything. Mine's not just... Mine's <laughs> I'm not going just on four. four. I'm going on Lions 15. If you're picking a, a test match to start tomorrow, this is why. I'm going off the back of what we've seen, knowing that Jamie's got a big game against Amptal coming up and <laughs> he can play his way into the team. You picked so, your mate. Just say it, mate. You picked your mate. Carry on. Tight head. Separate tight head. Ty Furlong. Yeah, same. Easy. Ty Furlong. Easy. Easy decision. It's going to be the interesting one. But these, the bat five is the most interesting. It'd be interesting Tough, to see it? what us experts. You go first. Uh, Marotoji. I've put Marotoji in there, so yeah. I'll give you my other luck after. As captain, yeah. no, I'd not have it. I haven't. <laughs> Ian Henderson. Really? Yeah, so I know. And that one was that's quite a ballsy call, but the work he got through. And the physicality that he produces every game, in how I think as an expert, non expert joker, thinks you can beat South Africa. If he's fit, IMO, he's in. There we go. My other second row, it was a close call between the old school and the new school. The new school being James Ryan, but I've just got to go with the skips. Alwyn Jones, he's my skipper. Alwyn Jones, give him the armband. Second row captain of the winning Six Nations team in Wales, performed beyond expectations of most people. He's got it in his locker. He knows what the Lions is, knows how to win in a Lions jersey. And there you go, Alan Wynne-Jones, mate. I, I had him and scrubbed him out because oh, that's what's horrible. in me. That, <laughs> horrible. That's what's in me. I actually messaged him on Instagram when I was drunk on Friday, say, congratulations, you need to put more pictures up. Didn't reply, but he put a picture up, so he must have seen it. <laughs> Number six, I've gone for a friend of the show, Ty Burn. Exactly, exactly the have same. Ty Burn, yeah, Ty Burn down at six, right. at seven. Oh, Hamish Watson. Yes, sir. Me too. You have to. He's English. He came to the Leicester Academy. We've sent him off to Scotland. He's playing unbelievably well with the best mullet you've ever seen in your life. Uh, it's close call between him and Tom Curry, and also Tipperick. And the VD, it's loads of them. But I just went with Hamish Watson on form. Yeah, there's a few, some under Hill as well. But anyway, we're not talking about the outsiders at the minute. Uh, we're talking about the insiders. Uh, eight, your go. No, I said uh, it's your go because I just went oh, Hamish it? Watson. Okay. Number eight, Jim, well, who you got? I found this one more difficult. And this is more on form and a big game player. And because I love Wales, Talupe Falata. Yes. Yes, you, yes. Yeah, yeah. Look at us. Look at look us. At us. Well, I had Sam Simmons written next to him, but then I can't pick him to start a Lions test match because he hasn't played in the Six Nations. So that was my thought process. But I've gone Toby Falatau as well. All right, here we go then. I think this could look very different because I'm an expert on the backs. You are, Jim. You are. Scrum off. Conor Murray. Ali Price. Conor Murray. All right. I'd say <laughs> Conor Murray because of his box kicks. Yeah, Ali Price. I, I've, is... never seen, I've never seen him get charged down. Ali Price for me is physical, he's quick yeah. at the base, he's played very well. Game. Yeah, he got charged down quite a few times by Marrow. Um, and Etzebeth will be all over him like a rash. So uh, that's why I've just gone Conor Murray with experience. And you'll, okay, understand, you just... you'll understand why I've gone Conor Murray in a minute. Who is it on now? Me or you? A, a fly half, it's your turn, Jim. <sighs> oh. I've gone Faz as captain. Really? Yeah. On form? Yeah. On form? No, no it or isn't all on form. It's going to be coach. Just because I might be working with the line, so I've got to make sure I'm on side <laughs> with anyone that I've bad mouth. Um, I just think uh, it's because Alan Wynne jones isn't captain. That's why I think Owen Farrell, regardless of his performances and question marks, I don't think there's anyone else. I say that with the utmost respect. He's a big test match player. Johnny Sexton was close, IMO. Uh, Finn hasn't done enough for me. He's going to be on the bench. But I've just, look, you know, deep down there's a love for Owen Farrell, whether he feels that or not. Um, I feel it, Owen. I feel it from you, mate. And I've gone for you as captain. Please follow me again on social. Please do follow me. <laughs> Did he unfollow you? He yeah, unfollowed me, yeah. yeah. Really, there's bit, Jim? There's been a bit of that. There's been a bit of that. Joe Marler and followed me, but he's now followed me back. And Sips blocked me. And now he's unblocked me, but he's not followed me. So there's been a bit of drama. <laughs> you spend <laughs> too much time looking at this sort of stuff, don't you, Jim? Who cares whether people follow you or not? But it, cares, oh, it, matters, it matters to you, doesn't it? 
It matched the building the brand, Andrew. That's it, there mate. And it's you who got me into that, not the other way around. Uh, fly half. I really wanted to go. I really did. Uh, I've gone down bigger. I could. I can agree. I could nod to that. Down bigger. Um, I don't think you can pick Owen Farrell on any form at all. Uh, I know, listen, if we go in test match animals, but this is what Eddie Jones did. He picked what he thought was the right player, whether they're playing well in form, out of form, whatever. And, and look where that, that got us fifth place and our worst ever Six Nations. So um, I, couldn't, I couldn't pick Owen Farrell because of that. Sexton got knocked out again at the weekend. Uh, I thought about going Sexton. So I've gone for bigger at 10. And we're not naming our bench, but I'd definitely go for Finn Russell on the bench. Oh, the controversial, unless you've gone for Faz at 12. Nope. Where are we going now? Are we going centres or are we going wingers? Let's go. 12. I generally go centres. Okay, okay. Uh, my centre pairing, and then, again, you can't put someone in like Manu to Ilangi because he's not played yet. I uh, think we might agree on this, you know. On form and on what we're going to face... I'm going Robbie Henshaw and Jonathan Davis as oh, a centre so combo. Close. Robbie Henshaw and Jonathan Davis as a centre combo. I've gone Robbie Henshaw and Chris Harris. No, you, what, what, which uh, one you're not liking? Oh, I know which one you're not liking because you've well, agreed no, with me I, on one of them. I like Chris Harris. Charles is a great lad, played with them at Newcastle, made his career. I said, mate, go for Scotland because, um, you know, similar to you, Jim. It's like, mate, go and play for Scotland. Now look. Because it's an. It's an easier way to get capped um, than play for England. He's joking. big, he's physical, and he is... Quick, quick. But, but he, Jonathan David, oh, it sounds horrible. How fit is he? If he, if he is 100% oh, man, fit... Why are you being horrible? He, I am, I am. Do you want to change it? Change it. No, don't. Chris Harris, I'll stick to my guns. Wingers then, Jim. Wingers. I realised when I was putting these down that maybe I don't know much about the back play because I wanted to put Keith Earls in desperately because of how he's played. If you're talking about in form, yeah. but I didn't. I went okay. for Duan van der Merwe and Liam Williams. No, Lewis Liam Williams is it, it, he's on the bench. He's coming on. He's, he's skidding Cheslin Colby when Cheslin's got a sore ankle. Yeah, I've gone George North. On the wing? Duan, yeah, I'm Duan van der Merwe. Look at you. North was, I was North was close to going in the centres with Henshaw, but I, lo I love Jonathan Davis. I think he's a great player. Um, he's so, a good yeah. lad as well. Yeah, top boy. So I've gone George North on one wing and Duan van der Merwe on the other wing. Re Summit to rip right. it up off the bench as well. Um, should we just say the 15 together? I mean, it's obvious, isn't it? Stuart Hogg. Ready? Hogg, my old lead. Ready? Stuart Hogg. Stuart Hogg. Stuart Hogg. Go. Boom. And captain, Andrew? I've gone for no. Faz as captain. No, I've gone uh, Alamin Jones as captain. Oh, of course you have. You said that, yeah. 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 I've been so uh, horrible. Hoggy, listen, it's so difficult to captain a team from fullback. You can't. Um, especially in you know something like this. You can for Scotland. Uh, but yeah, I just think Lions, it's got, it's got to be big Alan Wynn, isn't it, for me? You've, have you named Faz as captain as well? I have, but it's... I, hey, I can't, what are you after, no what are you after here? Out. What are you after here? You, you obviously have some, so you've picked a couple of Saracens boys in there that are in no form whatsoever. Is it something to do with the houses again? Is it something to do with the investigation from uh, HMRC around it is, it is to do with, I want Faz to follow me and retweet the interview I did with Andy Powell because I know he would have liked it. I know he would have <laughs> loved my chat with Andy Powell right up his street. So there we go. There's our Lions 15s. Let's have a quick chat about the Premiership because it was another crazy weekend, wasn't it? What a game at Ashton Gate. Bristol beating Quinns. Yeah, hell of a game. Semi's back and on absolute fire, eh, Jim? Yeah, the Dragons were good as well, weren't they? Did you watch that <laughs> one? I know. Um, I actually did. Uh, but, but Bristol, different team without him, I think. Semi's best player in the league, maybe in Europe. There's not many people that could stand at 10, drawing three defenders and just do a little pop-up like that and say, there you go. So imagine, imagine playing as Luke Morahan in that team or anyone in that team running Piers off him. Yeah, Piers O'Connor does it very well. You just think offload is coming, in it? One way or the other, just getting behind him, get to his left, his right. He'll find a way to find you. And yeah, uh, Quinns play very well again. They'll be kicking themselves, Quinns, because they have the lead, they're in control. And then capitulate. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, the yeah they did. Yeah, they did. I've still got this bugbear about Quinns. Why no, I've got a call. 
But I've got to call it out because maybe it's Ben Earl. He's a Saracen. Gets the ball ripped off him by um, Danny Kerr. Yeah. Who's grown his hair good on him. And then as he as he scores, he's rub- he rubs Ben Earl on the head as he walks past. I'm just like... <laughs> he did, yeah. That is such a Quinn's thing to do. Why have you been horrible, mate? They're doing well. They are doing well. They are. I saw Adam Jones do his interview after. He, he was looking uh, regal. He was looking regal and hairy and good. And they're definitely... I mean, to take it to the last kick of the game against Bristol's... You must well, be playing well. Yeah, 12, they went 12 points clear. Uh, Danny Kerr from the kickoff, then they lose the ball. A uh, bit of an error there. That led to them going to the corner. Then the driving mall gets a penalty try into the Simba Nugu. And then Bristol played and end up getting another penalty. Yeah, I mean, Quinn should have seen out the game, but yeah, Bristol are a proper team, aren't they? They're, you know, they're definitely easily now finishing top of the league, probably. Um, and Quinn's will be a little bit disappointed because obviously it's the trying to put pressure on Exeter to get that second place in that home semi-final because by then you're going to be allowed fans in the stadium hopefully and that will make a big difference um, but yeah Quinns are definitely going pretty well um, where they've benefited they've not lost anyone really have they over the international period uh, whereas other clubs have and they've obviously found a bit of form and a bit of confidence um, Bristol missing still missing a few but Sheedy one minute he's playing for Wales and winning the Six Nations next minute is kicking the winner uh, for Bristol and a hell of a conversion as well. Right footed, right touch line, curls it in and he has big curl on his kicks as well. So to measure that properly, hell of a nudge. And Goody Sale had four yellow cards but still managed to beat Wasps at the Rico. Yeah. Um, what is going on? I didn't see this game. I just saw your tweets and there was almost, uh, again, I've been to court a few times been locked up a couple of times as well back in the glory days. <laughs> Where's and this going? Sometimes there's no defence. You know, it's, <laughs> I'm guilty as charged officer. Were you on that roof while I was in the roof tank clan when I was in comp when I was younger? Guilty as charged. We saw you. We saw a six foot eight Yeti on the roof trying to get away from whoever you're trying to get away from. That was yeah. me, officer. You're trying to defend them. You can, sometimes some things are undefendable. And I say that having not seen the game. So it's a very superficial comment and I don't want to be too horrible but what's happened at Wasps? Confidence is like I, I, you say I'm trying to defend them I, I think I was pretty honest they had four yellow cards sailed in and Wasps didn't know how to win the game um, you know we confidence was low so we took a couple of penalties at goal I understand the first one uh, to put us ahead but then the second one you've got to be going they were down to 13 men at one point sale um, and I think I gave Northampton a bit of stick the other week for the, not understanding how to attack against 13 you know get a set piece get a scrum and then you've got space everywhere especially when you're 10 meters from the line but anyway yeah wasps there fair play to say they showed some real northern grit and south african steel um to stay in the fight and then win with the driving mall at the end but yeah wasps just not good enough um everything that went for wasps last year when they went on the run post covid to get to the final uh, that is the perfect opportunity. Everything went in their favour this match against Sale. Four yellow cards. You're not going to get a better opportunity to win uh, a game when you needed to win it, and they didn't. So, um, yeah, unfortunately for them, we're we're down near, I think we're 10th or something, but top four is gone, I think, for us now. Gloucester upset the champions. Well, it was Exeter well, on the 14th. Yes. To Plus, Don Armand, who's 44, <laughs> and Ollie Woodburn, that's 38. Yeah, I'll tell you what I did say. Harvey Skinner at 10 looks a good player. Um, Very good. Is he, is, is he related to Sam Skinner or not? No idea. He, well, Sam Skinner's Scottish, so you should know, Jim. You've not done your right. research? Yeah, well, I should do. Yeah. Should the, Spotify, um, the producers of Spotify didn't come back to me on that one. Yeah, no, they didn't. Uh, yeah, listen, Gloucester at home. Uh, they've got the bonus point. Exeter. And it was some interesting comments, actually, from Rob Baxter after the game around his expectations. Who, who was it? Well, just I, I presume some of the, he's basically called out some of the players for not putting it in enough, haven't, haven't he? Mm. Um, and listen, you knew by selection they're just focusing on this game down in Exeter on on Saturday. I'm doing it actually for BT Sport against Lee on the last 16 game. So they've had players with a lot of miles in their legs. They've changed the squad up, and you have got to remember a lot of these guys. They're not even playing A League. They're not playing. Um, you know, there's no Anglo Welsh Cup as it used to be, or Premiership Cup as it is now. Uh, to play in either where they're getting regular rugby. Some of these boys haven't played any rugby at all, hardly. So that's the hard thing uh, for them. But Gloucester put them to bed, played really well. Um, yeah, I like Josh Barton at 10 as a, a kid coming through. Um, 
they uh, you know they they outmuscled Exeter and, and dominated them really. Good game. I thought Gloucester. I thought Gloucester looked really good. To be fair, under a bit of pressure, big game for them. They took fifty, I think, last time they played Exeter. So from a selfish point of view, because I like Gloucester and Lewis Rees Samet as well, and Johnny May. And Ed Slater. I don't want to miss any more out. Atkinson's a fantastic player at 12. I'm happy to see Gloucester win that. But again, there's just so much ruggers on. And what happened before this to Newcastle? Well, the Cactus and Slim Shady squared up, it seemed. It went a bit viral on social. Did you see it, Andrew? The Cactus being John Welsh? John Welsh, yeah. Sorry, he's got the Carcass, the Cactus. Yeah, Carcass, Cactus, same thing. Um, Yeah, squaring up before the game. And I found out what it was. Go on. Because Welsh, for some for some for some context, Welsh has worked exceptionally hard to get back, and that was his first start in donkey's years, wasn't it? Two and a half years he's been out, yeah, with yeah. all sorts of injuries, awful injuries. He's fired up. Him and Genji, him and Eminem are looking at each other. It's like when they're having a wrap off, you know, in the Eminem film Eight Mile. It was like that. And Ellis Genge has thrown an obscenity out to John Welsh. One of the just something disgusting. Go on. What did he say? He's Scottish. He called him fat. Oh, he's gone for the fat line, has he? You can't. That's a bit mean. Horrid. What Horrid. did he say then? So he just said, he said, oh, you're fat. Oh, give me the words, Jim. Hey, I don't know. I don't know. But it's pretty horrible. I'll tell you one thing, though. When John Welsh did come steaming in angry because he's been called fat, don't fat shame people. But when he's come in and they've gone... Not head to head, but the approach was made. Genji backed off a bit, like he shot himself, didn't he? He did. Don't <laughs> a bit of context. I'm mates with John Welsh. I'm good mates with John yeah. Welsh. I was there when he got capped for Scotland against Italy. Chunk pulled out in the warm up against his calf. We're in Rome. I've given this speech about we're in Rome together. We're in the Colosseum. If we die, we die, and all that. And then John Welsh. I've never seen a man more red. It was 45 degrees. <laughs> he had an unbelievable game. Started at loose head. I call him chicken ball. He calls me noodles. I think he's married to a Chinese lady. Obviously, I'm a quarter Chinese. So there was some some kind of thing that bound us through Chinese menus. Um, but I'm a big fan of John Welsh. And like you said, we, I don't want to laugh about this next thing because he's dislocated his shoulder, right? Yeah. So it was nasty. And I know that it, he feels hard done by, I think a lot of the Newcastle players probably feel hard done by, by Jasper Visa's entry into the Rook. It's cheap. It is. Um, Carl Dixon looked at it, almost brushed it off, which I thought was a bit of a shit thing to do. And maybe it's because I, I, I love John Welsh and I know his story. Two and a half years he's been out for. Signed a deal with Gloucester before COVID. Uh, David Humpsville then leaves. That deal is no longer there. He hasn't got a job. Newcastle give him a lifeline and he trains extremely hard to get that opportunity to start against Leicester. He's obviously fired up for the game gets pinged for two scrums or the Newcastle scrum gets pinged a couple of times. Early engagement. And yeah, but I, I disagree with it. Like, I'm not just saying that. Like, obviously, I'm a Leicester fan as well. But then, yes, with Visa, and you see the, the shit thing about it, and this is the thing with Danny Kerr rubbing Ben Earl's head after he rips the ball off him. If you look on the TV, yes, with Visa, him and Harry Wells fist pump after. And I'm just like, you know, it's one of the artists who have done it and one of the most physical to, to have done it. You know, you've got John Welsh lying there injured, whether or not you know his backstory or not. Like, it's just a shit thing to happen. So, yeah. you know, I, think... I message Diggs, he's not come back to me. Uh, you know, about the... there's a Look, Leicester look very physical now. One of the positives about them, my goodness me, around the mall, around their breakdown, they look vicious, right, in some of the stuff that they're doing, which is great for them. They've got a few South African players in that pack now, which really add the physicality. But, you know, you've also, and we love Genji, he's a friend of the show, Van on the live show, You've got, to, you've got to go about your business in the right way. You've got to go about your business in the right way. And I question Leicester now. A few things that have happened around that, of, of being hard and physical, but then having an arrogant and a bit of a, you know, acting like knobs, really. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. And I think in Carl Dixon's defence, because I did think that looked horrible, and you feel for John Welsh, when they checked it and he looked at it and the TMO said, actually, his, his actions of of entry into the ruck are illegal. So where he's come from is illegal. But actually what he's done in terms of the clear out is legal from a contact point of view. So he, you know, had he have tucked an arm and flown in, as we've seen with some other players, I mean, don't talk to Chris Ashton about cleaning out rucks at the minute, because what it was he How doing bad. as well. 
But had he tucked an arm, that would have definitely been foul play. So the difference between foul play and it's a, it's a, it's a grey area because ultimately the foul play, the understanding that referees are, are saying is it has to be something illegal in terms of a the, your technique of clearing out, not your entry point. So, yeah, I mean, I completely agree with the sentiment of it. Um, you know, obviously there was things said around John Welsh and... Um, you know, the, the pre-match stuff with Ellis Genge and, you know, Jasper Visa is a, a big, powerful boy and seeing an opportunity to go and belt someone in the ribs, which, yeah, it doesn't look good. And you dislocate his shoulder off the back of it because he's in that position of of trying to, you know, go for the ball and, and jackal for it. It's, yeah, it's it's not good at all. And you just feel for massively for John Welsh and hope he can recover as quickly as, as you can. But, you know, dislocating his shoulder as a tighter prop is, is something pretty bad, isn't it? And Leinster senior coach Stuart Lancaster joins us. How are you, Stuart? Yeah, well, good, thanks. Thanks for the invite. Lanny, thanks for coming on. It's been a while. We've been trying to get you on for, for a uh, while, so it's, it's great to have you. It's been a long time since we looked at each other back in Dublin. Um, it was a night out. I saw you, you saw me. And uh, I think I was heading into a nightclub and you were just dropping off. So uh, it's been great to see you from afar doing your thing over in Dublin. Uh, how long has it been now? How long have you been over there? Uh, yeah, this is uh, five years in um, September, which is amazing, really. You know, I signed, I signed um, for the end of the, well, I signed in September 2016 uh, and just signed for the one year. Um, uh, the defence coach had left Leinster and Leo was looking for someone to come in to take his place. Um, Matt O'Connor had just left, obviously, if you remember, um, yeah. prior to Leo taking over. And then uh, things Went well that first year. We didn't win uh, a title. In fact, we lost two semis. We lost against Claremont and then lost against Scarlets in the Pro 14 uh, semi. Um, but then by then, you know, I'd sort of really enjoyed it. Signed for another two years. Uh, and then following you, we did the double, uh, which was fantastic. And the year after, obviously, we lost against Saris in the final. And then, um, uh, but then won the Pro 14 title against uh, Glasgow. Uh, and then, so I signed for another two years, which takes me up to now, and then just re-signed now for another two years, so I'll make it seven. Lovely. Wow. Lovely. Cool. The big thing for me is clearing up this this night out that Jim keeps talking about, because he mentioned it, he said, Lanny looked at me, and uh, you know I looked at him, and we gave each other a nod. I don't believe that you even knew who he was, Lanny. <laughs> <laughs> I reckon that's the true story. You didn't even see him. Uh, I think Jim's, Jim's got this thing there. Made, 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 made it out, I turned up, was rocked up in some, like, souped up car and dropped off by a sofa and <laughs> turned up in a rickshaw bike with my wife and kids on the back of a, a few beers in Temple Bar to be honest but um, uh, yeah you know, I, it's the last person on earth so I, I was trying to negotiate my daughter and a friend into Copperface Jacks of all places and I was going what a place there, like well I've not actually made it in to be honest Andy but uh, <laughs> uh, we yeah. have but uh, yeah I think most people in Dublin have but um, you know, it's a fantastic city to live in and um just love it, you know, the Irish people, um, the crack here. Obviously, you know, COVID's massively affected every community, but, uh, you know, Dublin really is, you know, it, it's built on, you know, the pubs and the nightclubs and the restaurants and the, the environment and people going out and having a good time, that, you know, so it's really been felt over here. Yeah, Do you get to enjoy that, Lanny? Do you get to enjoy that, Lanny? Because obviously being a coach is a full-on job. We've got the easy job, haven't we? We come on air and make up stories about nights out in Dublin. <laughs> do you know what I mean? It grows our arms and legs over the years. But I look at it and obviously your story is quite an unbelievable story. And we're not going to talk about five years ago and all these things that are now resurfacing. But how difficult is it to be in a coach and actually trying to enjoy it? And I know that you're, you you love coaching. It's It's not just a job. It seems to be more than that. But... And are there times when you enjoy it, when you win these championships and you've got to go and win the next one and you've got to keep the momentum going? Are there moments where you can sit back and, and actually yeah, yeah, reap what yeah, you saw? Yeah, for sure. Obviously, clearly, when you, when you coach in England, you know, the intensity and the scrutiny around the role and, and everything that goes with it is it's a pretty all-consuming job, really. And, you know, you do sometimes, you know, you, you look back now and you think, geez, you know, beating the All Blacks and some of the amazing Six Nation games that took place in in all the four years, you know, I was there um, and we did enjoy the moments and I did it, you know, but I, I promised myself after the World Cup, that I really would enjoy the moments uh, and being over here, you know, you're a little bit under the radar a bit uh, and the Irish are very unassuming anyway, so they don't, they don't come and bother you uh, if you're out having a good time with your wife or your friends or whatever. Um, but the main thing for me has been trying to 
hit that sweet spot between loving the job, which I do, and trying to commute backwards and forwards to Leeds to see the family. Um, Nina still lives in Leeds. The kids, Sophie's at Newcastle, uh, Uni, uh, Newcastle Union. And Dan's at Leeds, but he's playing, he's doing well with his rugby, you know. And, and it, the COVID things meant I've not been able to commute since July, really. Um, but yeah, you know, when, when we're over here, it's you know, no one bothers you and everyone just you know, lets you get on with your own life, really. So it's great. It must have been exceptionally hard, though, um, you know, with the, all the success that you're having out in Dublin as a coach uh, and as part of that Leinster community, really, with your family back in, in England and also having to try and fit in that community. I know times are different now with COVID, but as a coach, I, I, my knowledge of you as a coach is that someone that goes into the, such detail around not only the, the game this week, but also improving players. Where do you find the time? Because coaching now is seven days a week. 24 hours a day, isn't it, pretty much? Do you sleep? Do you, yeah, do you no, get Leinster, much time to yourself? I mean, Leinster, Leinster were very good. Uh, and, you know, I'd go home maybe on a day off. Um, but a lot of the time on the commute, you'd be doing your analysis for the training session or you're doing your preview review. You know, you, a lot of the computer work that you'd normally do, you sit and do it on the plane. So it wasn't really a big big deal, to be honest. And, uh, you know, the, the time away from, from work as well, it's family time, is important as well. You know, again, you know, learning after the World Cup, making sure you get that... That balance right um now now obviously when i'm in dublin and i can't commute um it can be a bit all consuming so every night you're on your own if you're not careful you can end up just watching rugby all the time um but i'm pretty good on like get myself out and, and and exercising and and you know um life life after rugby really you know i can switch on netflix and, and switch off pretty well um plus there's a lot of face times to family anyway so uh you're just trying to to commute, uh, you know, connect remotely, really. Yeah, we'll come on to the game at the weekend. Obviously, a fantastic result, but we need to talk about some of the stuff you just mentioned there. I think it's good that we talk about the pressures of coaching. You you would have, if you're on social media or you've seen social media or you've read anything to do with the news, the kind of pressure that Eddie Jones finds himself under. The sport's very fickle, right? And again, you'll know that more than anyone. What, what, what are you thinking about Eddie Jones and, and what he's having to deal with now? Is it just part and parcel of being head coach of England? Yeah, yeah, it's definitely, there's definitely an expectation. I mean, I was, in some ways, when I started, I got the interim job, so I had less less of that immediate pressure that, that could sometimes come on. And, you know, we won four games out of five, that first Six Nations. Mm. Um, and we had, um, we had to ironically beat Ireland by about 30 odd points at Twickenham in the last game. So, but then we went to South Africa uh, and you know, it was very early in my tenure, quite a young team and, we lost two narrowly, then we drew, we drew the third. Then we came to the Autumn Internationals. I remember, I think we lost the first couple of games and we had New Zealand coming around the corner. So the media were beginning to build this narrative of, you know, four games, five games without a win and this, that and the other. And then fortunately, we beat New Zealand and you got that sort of breathing space that you needed to sort of kick on. And the next Six Nations, we won four out of five and, and things sort of, you know, it kept, it kept, <laughs> kept the media at bay, so to speak. Um, you know, again, I was lucky that you know every Six Nations we were that close to to nailing it, but we won four games out of five over Six Nations. You know, so when you when you're at England and you you come in second bottom, I think pressure will come on, irrespective of what's happened in the past. Um, and clearly, the team are feeling that at the moment. Yeah, and definitely, and I think the only thing that would have taken us from four out of five wins to five out of five would have been picking me, Lanny. That's all you needed to do, mate. That's <laughs> <laughs> in, my, in my dreams. Uh, yeah, um, well, let's uh, talk about... I actually went with Charlie Hudson to start, but uh, maybe that was the mistake I made. I could have got that. <laughs> oh, you got it right. You got it right. You def- Lanny, you definitely got it right, mate. I'll be honest. Um, Charlie, it was Charlie. Yeah, it, it, we started the same day, actually, and uh, I picked Owen at 12, and uh, uh, obviously then Owen came through, and George was always in the... You know, obviously, but by working in the age grade pass with England, I knew who was coming through, and with George and um, obviously Henry Slade was coming through as well, and a lot of good, talented players. So I knew what was coming, but it was just trying to accelerate their development and speed up, speed up time. Um, you did a great job, and obviously, people are going to go back over the 2015 World Cup and 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 remember that. But I think people do forget that the Six Nations, you finished second, 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 you know, prior to that. So it was a successful era. Um, the, the, the irony is, um, if the bonus point for tries had existed, I think we'd have won two of those. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. But, but uh, yeah, no, like I say, I, I, look, I look back, you know, um, obviously with regret at what happened at the end, um, but, but with a lot of pride when I see the team, doing so well you know in 2019 and obviously the Six Nations 2016 and everything else that came with it 
and the younger lads who were one cup, two cups when I took over, were now 60, 70, 80, 90 cups who are leading the team. Yeah, definitely. And was the one point that you look back on and go, I wish I'd have just changed that? Or was it just something that, you know, I was working over the World Cup for in the media and stuff, and it was, you know, effectively boiled down to, you know, draw, not drawing that Wales game to, to qualify for the knockouts. And is that the one moment or is it something else that you think there was more to it than that? I think, I, think uh, I probably would have liked a bit more cohesion going into the World Cup. I'd, I'd have had one more warm-up game for sure. You know, I actually met Eddie after the World Cup and... Um, one thing I said was, you know, I think, you know, one more warm-up game, I think. Uh, Owen was injured, Owen Farrell was injured during the whole of the Six Nations 2015. Um, and that sort of combination of playing George and Owen together, you know. Um, like I say, some of the younger players who I knew were, were going to be talented, but were still breaking into their, getting regular slots in their premiership clubs. Um, but overall, you know, I felt we were going into it in good shape and you know, we had a tough pull. And unfortunately, you know, we, we lost a game that, you know, I think if you play it, Many times over, you'd win it more, more often than you'd lose it. Um, yeah. And, you know, the consequences, obviously, uh, well, we know what's happened. Yeah, it, it, because I, I weren't going to bring it up, but while we're talking about it, we may as well. Chris Robshaw did a thing for BT Sport. I don't know if you've seen it. Um, it spoke about his captaincy and stuff like that. But you must have been approached loads to talk about it. I've, I've not really seen much where you've spoken about it. So the fact that we've got you on here and we're speaking about it is unbelievable for us. But... How much do you think, you know, a lot's happened for you personally and successes at Leinster, but much thought gone into that 2015, the kind of fallout and the stuff with Burgess and all this stuff that's happened after. Have you just let, let it be and just move forward? Or is, it, is, is there an underlying things that you think about and want to say? Yeah, yeah, obviously. I mean, with all due respect, again, I'm not going to give you the exclusive now, unfortunately. The, <laughs> Wait the for the overview. book. I'll give you the overview. But uh, no, I actually personally, I'm, I'm quite old-fashioned in, I guess, I think a lot of things that go on inside camps and inside changing rooms and inside private meetings should remain that way. Um, and I also believe in keeping my counsel and, you know, I'll, I'll pass on the lessons learned to the people who I think it's really important to, and I've done it to um, coaches, I've done it in, in private settings, I've done it to other sports. I had a, I had a call, um, a while ago with Gareth Southgate and the soccer team in the lead up to the World Cup. Um, I had one not so long ago with England netball, the Commonwealth Games coming up, uh, home, home Commonwealth Games, um, uh, England cricket, you know, so of course you want to pass on what you've learned. Um, it seems illogical to me to, to have been at the RFU for eight years and uh, four years as head of elite player development, Saxons were in the academy programme, England coach for four years, and not to pass on what I've learned to coaches. That's illogical, you know. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't, know, I wouldn't use the media as the platform, personally. Um, because I think, I think uh, um, there's a privacy about, about certain things that I'd never share anyway. Yeah, yeah definitely. Good on you. Yeah, definitely. It's a good, good way to be. We completely agree with that. Although we wouldn't have a podcast if we didn't talk to people. So thanks for yeah, coming yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, <laughs> let's talk about the news from the weekend. And obviously, congratulations on uh, the fourth title on the spin. You go over to Leinster and... It's no coincidence that they start dominating and winning things. Um, how good was the game at the weekend? It was never going to be a try fest against your your big rivals in Munster, but it was a hell of a ding dong. Um, and actually, you know, it seemed from an outsider's point of view, you rewarded a lot of the players that got you to that final, as opposed to relying on just the internationals coming straight back in. It must have been, you know, a really good feeling afterwards. Yeah, it's a bit a bit of both, really. I mean, one of the challenges with Leinster is that obviously we have so many international players, you know. I, I can't actually think of a club team in the world that provides so many internationals. You know, we had 18 in camp. Yeah. So one of the positives on the back of Ireland beating England was they bounced back into, into Leinster on the... Obviously, beating England on the Saturday. We got them back on the Monday. We're playing Munster on the Saturday in the final. And you're trying to reintegrate, you know, the players back into your system, your calls, your philosophy. You know, it's not dissimilar. Obviously, I know Faz and Catty and John Fogarty and Sam Lee speak really well. Um, but um, there is obviously different call and things, and that cohesion piece, and as you say, there's a group of players who during the Six Nations have won those Pro 14 games who've got you to the final as well. So it's a really difficult dynamic um, uh, to manage, but I thought the players were exceptional, really. Leo manages the squad really well and you know explains the selection criteria. We knew we had too long this weekend as well. But obviously, you know, the, the whole thing is about Munster-Leinster, and you can't appreciate the rivalry between the two provinces until you're actually here. Um, you know, I guess it's 
you've played in games, you know, in England where the big, you know, whether it's a Leicester or Northampton or a Black yeah. Bristol or whatever, you know, it's that and more. And obviously in this particular game, there's a lot riding on it because Munster were at full strength pretty much um, and we're playing really well. So it was a massive game for us. So to play, the scoreline doesn't reflect, I think, you know, the, uh, the quality of the performance I think we put in. I thought we defended exceptionally well, no tries. Um, we missed probably three or four. And if you've been in our review this morning, you probably would have gone, geez, did they lose? Because, um, you know, <laughs> lots of opportunities that we created, you know, our approach work, if you like, and our ability to keep the pot of contact moving and work off the ball, work with good shape and alignment, you know, was really good on the back of, let's say, lads coming back in just on the Monday. And we didn't nail the final piece of the jigsaw um, in terms of tries all the time, but there was a lot of really good stuff. And obviously to win the game the way we did um, was just satisfying. And to do it four years on the bounce, I think probably one thing that people don't appreciate again about the four years is, is you know, you, the, like 2018, you'd beat Rass we beat Racing in the European Cup final. Then we had to go and beat Munster in the semi-final and then beat Scarlets in the final. The following year, when we lost against uh, Saracens at, at um, Newcastle in 2019, we had to pick ourselves up from losing that final and then beat Munster in the semi-final and then beat Glasgow in Glasgow at Celtic uh, Park for, in the final. So it's, it, it takes some resilience to, to achieve that as a group. And this time again, you know, a different kind of resilience to get the win. And um, yeah, delighted for the lads because they're such a good group of lads. And, and as you say, all roads now then lead to, to knockout rugby in, in Europe. Yeah, we'll come on to that. We also want to give a big shout out to Devon Tone, a friend of the show. He's been on, he's been to a live show. Maybe that night in Dublin, actually, that uh, he come to. But <laughs> yeah, he's a fantastic man. Um, you know, we've joked a little bit about Dev on here, some of the, the battles that I had against him. But Lent's his most capped player now. And I suppose you look at Dev, and I can say this because I'm six foot nine. You, you know, is the game made for the taller, leaner man now? But Dev, for me, just seems to have got better and better with the physicality. I think it was a game in Europe, maybe last year or the year before, where the physicality that he showed in that game, but a special mention has got to go to arguably the heartbeat of the club. Yeah, yeah. And I, th I think to put it into context, and uh, we had, uh, we've had 57 players play for Leinster this season, which is phenomenal, really, in terms of depth. So a lot of young 19, 20, 21 year olds making their debut for Leinster, getting one cap. So to achieve what Dev has achieved, you have to play, what, 25 games a year for Leinster in the Pro 14 or in Europe and do that for 10 years. Mm -hmm. You know, I just can't see how, you know, anyone's going to get close to breaking that in the future. Mm. You know, 262 times, you know, uh, that's, it's an incredible. In run. the second row, in the second row as well. And then playing for Arnold. The yeah, exactly. And lobbying international rugby on top of that as well. Um, outstanding. Well, let's look forward to the game against Toulon on Friday then. Um, you mentioned that you've used 57 players this season in the league. Uh, how hard is the balance going to be now between picking your rock stars against the guys that have, have done so well and won the final effectively. Um, but also the six-day turnaround's key as well, isn't it? I know there's a couple of injury doubts. Uh, Sexton came off with uh, HIA and Ross Burns got a bit of a leg. If you need a 10, mate, I'm not fit. That's all I'm saying. Um, is that ankle surgery? <laughs> how, do you, how do you see the game on, on Friday? And, and is a six-day turnaround after a final? Is it, again, just a, a test that Leinster will take in their stride? Or is it something that, as a coach, you think, geez, that shouldn't be the case? Yeah, it's not ideal. It's not ideal. Um, you know, a lot of the English clubs, you know, look at Exeter, for example, you know, they rested and, you know, they can, they can go fully loaded. But in some ways, you know, you're getting back battle hard and ready players from the England game. Obviously, you're into Munster and then you, you go on, you know. And I think, you know, the side we picked for Munster, you know, we had Tyke Phil on the bench, but we started Andrew Porter, Ronan Keller, Reese Ruddock, who was just in the squad for Ireland. You know, Jack Conan started, uh, Josh van der Fleer started. Um, Luke McGrath started for us and uh, Ross Byrne started and Ross Byrne was on the bench. Luke McGrath arguably could be in the squad. Anyway, so you've got Jameson Gibson Park and Johnny on the bench and James Lowe on the bench, but you're starting, you know, Dave Carney and Jordan Lama. So <laughs> Crazy, eh? It's, um, you know, it's, the strength and depth is phenomenal. So you can change and freshen your team up um, and not feel like you're weakening it. That said, you know, obviously when you play against Toulon, it's not the Toulon of, you know, when I was with England and there was like, Johnny was there and, and um, Steph Armitage and those lads. It's, it's, it's more a French based team now, incredibly big and powerful, like big, as big a box as there are forwards. And, 
you know, Carbonell obviously is the key, and Serena they're the key, the key players in their in their game. Um, Manonu managed to get himself sent off yesterday against yeah, uh, did. Leon, so I'm not entirely sure how how that's going to play out. Um, but no, they're a massive team, um, and I don't think Leinster have beaten them actually. There's been some ding dongs before my time. Um, so yeah, we need to be at our best because they play. Yeah, you know, I don't know what your perception is, but they play more like to lose than than say a, 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 than say a Montpellier. Um, yeah. So they'll move the ball around. Um, they'll play a lot of lot of width, um, and they're ultimately trying to create one on ones for their strike runners to to cause you trouble. So we need to be 100% on point defensively. Um, and then also just bring our the game of movement that we can play, the ability to move big fellas around, um, keep the intensity high, tempo high. Uh, you know, hopefully it'll be a nice dry, dry evening. I think the weather's set nice for the week. Um, but we're looking forward to it. You know, Johnny's uh, flying through the the sort of return to play protocols. Um, so and Ross Byrne, um, he trained today actually. So, but we're still missing. You know, um, Kaelin Doris, um, James Ryan. Gary Ringrose, you know, there's still a fair few Will Connors, you know, good players who are missing out as well. So we're desperate to do well in Europe. It's a massive goal for Leinster. And obviously, if we win this game, uh, we end up going away to Lyon or Exeter. <laughs> Big games. So, uh, thanks very much for the, um, uh, you know, we won our two pool games. Um, but yes, we got this home, home last 16, but we're away for the quarters against uh, extra Lyon. So... Um, there's another big big weekend to come after this if, if we get through. Perfect. Thanks, Lanny. Lanny, thanks, mate. That was amazing. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Goody. And thanks to all of you for listening. Don't forget to hit subscribe and check us out on YouTube as well. Ruby Pod. Pod, pod, pod. Spotty Pod. <laughs>